So what you have in front of you, the, the, is that the first document? Yes. Well, I don't know if it's the first one listed on your website. It's the first one I'm going to discuss. Yep. Um, so I'm guessing Laura is going to be joining us, but since we're at 130, why don't we kick off? So um, just by way of uh, introduction, the president had issued an executive order last week with regard to um, energy infrastructure. And I personally have gotten a number of questions about this. And instead of um, just hogging Luke's time to get a you know, personal kind of rundown on this, I let it share it with the committee. So I asked Luke if, if he could come in here and you know, speak to this executive order and you know, to the extent that it may affect some of the things that we're looking at in here. So thank you for joining us, Luke. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. For the record, Luca Marland, Director of Legislative Council and Chief Counsel of the General Assembly. I was asked to come in today and review with you two executive <coughs> orders issued by President Trump. So to set the stage, don't forget that there is a hierarchy of law, if you will. The Constitution of our country, statute, federal statute, or for that matter, some is the state statute regulations promulgated by a federal agency pursuant to federal law, agency guidance, <coughs> and executive orders. So that will be important as we go through what impact this executive order really has short and medium term. So current law is the Clean Water Act, which is in 33 USC, United States Code, uh, 1341 is the section we're going to talk about. It's often called Section 401. That's sort of the phrase that most people know it as. And what it does is it requires <coughs> any applicant for a federal license or permit to conduct any activity that may result in discharge into the navigable waters of the United States to provide the federal agency with a certification from the state that the discharge does not violate the Clean Water Act. There also is language that if a state fails to, within a reasonable time, uh, issue this certification, not to exceed one year, the certification requirement is deemed waived. So what this section of federal law does is it requires a state to certify that a proposed project that might impact the waters of the United States does not violate the Clean Water Act. So it gives a state a role in this process. This is a federal statute, and that's important for what I'm going to mention <coughs> later on. Now, the executive order you have on the screen, promoting energy infrastructure and economic growth, was issued on April 10th, and it does five main things. Number one, it requires the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, to control <coughs> with states and Indian tribes, and then begin the process of amending its rules. It requires the EPA to update its guidance. It requires other federal agencies to work with the EPA to update their rules and guidance. It has provisions concerning the transportation of liquefied natural gas, and then it requires various reports. So let's now walk through the text of the executive order. Section 1 sets forth the purpose. I will not summarize all of this. Uh, don't hesitate to read it if you wish. Section 2 it gives the policy objectives that inform the subsequent sections. And essence, Section 2 is sort of similar to findings that you may have in your proposed bills or your statutes. It gives a reason why this executive order is being issued or its goals. Section <coughs> In Section 2, perhaps the most important ones are A, C, and D. So A talks about efficient permitting processes and procedures that employ a single point of accountability and avoid duplication and redundant reviews. C concerns timely action on infrastructure projects. And D concerns increased regulatory certainty. So these are the objectives of the executive order. Section 3 states that it requires the Environmental Protection Agency to review current regulations, its current regulations and guidance concerning Section 401, which I summarized for you at the very beginning of my presentation, 
and to focus on the scope of state review and the various timelines involved and how long the process takes. So once again, I won't read for you the whole thing, but the gist of this is that the EPA will look at current regulations and guidance as to those issues. Under Section 3B, it states, upon the completion of this review process, the EPA shall, no later than 60 days after the date of this order, issue new guidance, so this is once again internal guidance, to the states and authorized tribes. Then under C, upon the completion of the review that we just discussed, the EPA will publish new proposed rules as to the Clean Water Act. So they do a review, they consult with the states, they consult with the uh, Indian tribes, they issue new guidance, and then they issue new proposed rules. The issuance of the proposed rules, or new proposed rules, is supposed to be within 120 days of the date of this executive order. And then under D, there's a requirement that other federal agencies will update their guidance and their rules to conform to the changes that the EPA has undertaken. Section 4 concerns a transportation study and update of their rules to uh, allow liquefied natural gas to be transported via rail. And then Section 5, and I think it's in 5B, is requires the Department of Labor to report on retirement plans and proxy voting um, as to investments in the energy sector. So something very, very different, but it's requiring the Department of Labor to report on the use of proxy by retirement plans as to energy sector investments. Section 6 deals with energy rights of way in federal land. And then in Section 7, you have a number of reports. Uh, for example, in Section 7, there's a report on um, barriers to the transportation of energy to the Northeast, uh, New England states. There's a uh, report on limitations to the export of coal, oil, and um, <coughs> natural gas from the west coast of the U.S. And in Section 8, there's a requirement to have a report on what assistance can be given by the federal government and these agencies to states to implement <coughs> the goals of this executive order. And then finally, in Section 9, there's a report on encouraging economic growth in Appalachia. So I'm going through those very, very quickly because I don't think that's really the heart of the executive order, nor the heart of this committee's concerns. I wanted to quickly talk about the other executive order and then pull the threads together about what impact these might have on energy siting decisions. But before I move to the second executive order, are there any questions about what I've covered so far? Yeah. Uh, so this covers um, federal permitting, right? Is that only interstate? Well, this executive order uh, covers the Clean Water Act, and I think it's really targeting the state role in certifying a project's compliance with the Clean Water Act. If you remember, I began by talking about how the states have a role in certifying that if any project is having an impact on the navigable waters, that the Clean Water Act, the federal law, is being complied with. So there's a state role in that uh, approval process. And it seems that this executive order is focused on how long that takes, whether there's redundancy or confusion or a lack of clarity in those processes. And a tangentially related question. Sure. Um, so in various parts, it seemed like it's requiring rulemaking within 90 days. It sure does, and I'll get to that in a moment. Okay. I think that's a very tight timeline. I don't, know if, that will be, I don't know if that will be achieved or not. 
Do you want me to call on the member, yeah, Mr. Go, Chair? Do you please. want to? I think no. that's on your time. I think you were next. Yeah. Uh, so, again, any, anything that's being done with hospital infrastructure in state without going outside the state boundaries, does, that, does this still apply? So this does not impact state law. It does not impact if issuance of a certificate of public good, for example, from the Public Utilities Commission, which we talked about. And witnesses have discussed this is only relevant to well the beginning of the CO is only relevant to the Clean Water Act there's other requirements about reports and other things but, so. just to clarify you said early on about the the state the states have a certain amount of time to certify that the a, a proposal does not negatively impact um, and that if they don't then that um, it's a team blade right yeah. But what can they say it does, uh, can they issue a statement that it does not, that it does negatively affect? Oh, that it does? Yes. yes. Okay. They can refuse so to So as long as they meet the deadline for yep. saying whatever they, they have to say, then, um, okay. That, was, that wasn't clear because the way sure. you said it was, okay, thank you. And um, I am not very knowledgeable about the Clean Water Act. Michael O'Grady in our office is the expert on that. So if you want to get more into the weeds about, you know, what that process is or how long it normally no. takes or the steps, yeah. you'd be glad to I, come and test. Yeah, I just want to make sure that the sure. state, if the state found that it was the, the, the terrible harm, if the state could say that as well. Yeah. So let's jump to the second executive order issued on the same date. This one is concerning the issuance of permits with respect to facilities and land transportation crossing at international boundaries. In other words, Canada or Mexico. And this uh, EO is a little shorter than the last one. And once again, Section 2 has policy, which are in essence the findings about what this executive order is meant to achieve or the problems it's meant to address. And it talks again about efficient permitting processes in A, timely action on infrastructure projects in C, and increased regulatory certainty in D. So it echoes some of the same concerns as the other executive order. I'm sorry, actually I was looking at the first executive order when I said that, my apologies. So let me jump back. So section two does, actually which one do I have on the screen? I think I might have confused them. You've got the second one. Do I have the second one on the screen? Yeah. So there's a purpose of section one, and then section two jumps into um, cross-border infrastructure, presidential permit application procedures. And what this executive order does is it takes, um, it requires that the process for determining whether, or recommending whether a president should issue a permit <coughs> for a project that crosses an international boundary, whether it's a pipeline or some other kind of project or a bridge, for example, that that information goes to the Secretary of State's office. The Secretary of State is made the point person to get that information, to obtain other information, to reach a preliminary recommendation that they would give to the President, and then the President would make a decision as to whether to grant that permit or not. It also revokes some older executive orders from 2004 and 1968, and so it doesn't change the process from what I can tell from reading it, but it seems to be an attempt to centralize the fact finding, the gathering information <coughs> in the Secretary of State's office, and then to set timelines for that office to reach a determination to make a, re a recommendation to the President. I don't think this second executive order is as important or relevant as the first one. Um, reading the news, I don't know if this is accurate, it seems to be focused on XL pipeline and what, getting that approved to cross the boundaries, the borders. Yeah. So, a, a quick question I have there, and this may be a real stretch, but um, <coughs> I'm not even sure that it, we have two pipelines that cross the Canadian Vermont border, I believe. We have, yes, I think Vermont Natural Gas is their pipeline, and then the one we discussed earlier in the Northeast Kingdom from Portland, the Portland pipeline. Right, so those are already existing. Yes. Um, and I, I'm wondering to the extent this Sorry. In a uh, in a roundabout way, 
could potentially affect either of those. Um, and, and again, I'm reaching here, but the one that goes to the Northeast Kingdom, if uh, the flow of that pipeline is reversed, would that be open to any regulatory? I don't know the answer to that question. I'm yeah. sorry. Okay. We can try to get the information. I don't don't know. Okay. So the takeaways from both of these executive orders are, first of all, they, they do not, they cannot change federal statute. So for example, the Clean Water Act is still in effect, the language is still in effect. This executive order does not change that law. <coughs> what the first executive order does is it asks the EPA to begin the process of changing their own internal guidance, which remember is lower down in the hierarchy than the regulations or the law, than statute, and then to begin the process of proposing changes to their regulations. It does have very tight timelines to do that. Those timelines might be optimistic because it requires public comment. It usually is a long, drawn-out process, even <coughs> after the uh, new regulations or change regulations have been proposed and commented on and gone through the process and ultimately adopted, it is very likely that there will be litigation. So these timelines in the first executive order seem quite optimistic to actually have new regulations in place. And even if there's new regulations in place, they don't change a federal statute. They may have an impact, but they don't change the actual federal statute. And these are, um, Luke, these are, with regard to the EPA, these are just Clean Water Act? The regulations are, in the beginning sections are pertaining to the Clean, the Water, Clean Water Act, Act yes. That, that section I mentioned, 401, that gives yeah. the states the yeah. ability to certify. Okay. Yeah. There's other things, that remember, about <clears throat> transportation. And, yeah, I yeah, saw gotcha. that. Um, I got that. I just wanted sure. to make sure yeah. I, I knew that. Uh, in the second uh, executive order, it talks about okay. presidential permit. Yep. Applications. I, I'm not familiar with that term. What is a presidential permit as opposed I, to commerce or? I'm not very familiar with it either. So. <coughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I think you had your hand up first. <laughs> um, do you know if the, the courts have made any decisions about how precipitation affects navigable waterways? I, I don't know the answer to okay. that. Maybe we could get it. You know, Michael might or even Ellen might. I don't. So. Thank you. And, and just to drive home the point, this doesn't override any prior court decisions either. So this is, once again, this is beginning a regulatory process that may take a number of years and is not going to make any changes short term. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, I just wanted to make, uh, just as a point of information, the N National Conference of State Legislators sent out a uh, notification yesterday that the EPA invited state legislators and governors to participate in a webinar tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern Time, presenting a summary of the feedback the agency has received thus far, and will provide an opportunity to hear state input on provisions of the executive order that may require additional clarifications as it pertains to Section 401 and related federal regulations and guidance. I think uh, Senator Bray is planning on participating in that. Uh, but and I read prior guidance from NCSL that one of you forwarded to me. I basically agreed with what they stated. I mean, it seemed to be accurate. Um, <coughs> up in the Northeast Kingdom, there's a section of the Missisquoi River as well as Trout River that mm -hmm. have a forever wild and scenic rivers designation, mm -hmm. which has its own guidelines around anything that um, uh, impedes the free flowing characteristics of the rivers or its scenic and natural values uh, has to be uh, evaluated through a Section 7 review. And I'm just wondering if, if that would affect that particular federal designation as well. I, I don't know. And I can find out. Um, that might be Michael O'Grady. I don't know if Ellen would know the answer to that. But we can circle back to you. But 
That doesn't seem to be mentioned in these EOs, but we'll check. <coughs> Any questions for me? Um, so how do you, it, as far as, as the, the bills under, the, the two bills under discussion relating to fossil fuel pipelines in this committee, does this have any impact? Impact on people's opinion or policy? I don't, I don't make a comment. But this isn't impacting anything short term. It doesn't change anything short term. It doesn't change federal regulations short term. It may, after they go through the process, the EPA may change its regulations. That could have an impact. But I'm guessing they also have to get through litigation after they propose their changes. And none of it changes existing federal law. So, so the impact would be if EPA rules or regs change in the future, having gone through the process yep. and court challenges. Yep. I think it will take quite a bit of time to shake out and see what, if any, changes are proposed, adopted, survive litigation, down the road, what, if any, impact that has. It's no impact short term. If an EPA rule and a state statute came into direct conflict, um, do you have any insight on how that would play out? I, I, it might be a preemption issue. I have to look at the federal law. So <coughs> federal law often um, trumps state law. It, it depends. So I'd have to see. But right. it's hard to say in general. I think in the, just from what I've read in news accounts, one of the things that um, has occurred with some frequency in New York State in the last couple of years is the uh, executive branch there using the state's power to enforce the Clean Water Act has uh, slowed down or uh, refused uh, pipeline applications in the state based on the Clean Water Act, is my understanding. And um, my sense is there's some frustration in the executive branch from Washington of the use of the Clean Water Act to, to um, to stall or to uh, prevent some of these pipelines going forward. I think that's one of the things that's, uh, that's driven that seems like it's forward. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? One the uh, <coughs> I'm just trying to picture uh, what would be on a conveyor belt across <laughs> That's good, good catch. <laughs> I don't know. It was a, I noticed that too. I don't yeah. know. Coal or oil. So, yeah. Um, there was also a news story that I read uh, that um, I want to check in with the Attorney General's office, but I think that there's a group of Attorney Generals around the country, I'm going to say a dozen, that have um, raised particular issues with this executive order. I don't know if we're involved in a lawsuit in the state, but I think Vermont has, has joined that um, concern. I didn't find anything on the website. So if there are any follow-up questions, let me know. As I told you, Michael, who is the expert on Clean Water Act itself, I could give you more background if you want to go there. Glad to testify, but let us know if you need more info. All right. Did you have a question? Just reconfirming the question that Robin asked. So with regard to the bills that are in front of us right now, <coughs> And this is right now not in conflict potentially with the passage of those bills, but could be sometime in the future. That's not what he said, but I'm trying to no, it's grapple with. Not quite what he asked. Um, I'm trying to reframe your answer. Yeah, so you were. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that. Um, I, I would say it doesn't change applicable federal law. It doesn't change applicable federal regulation. Right now, you let the process on. I think H51 and these other bills you're dealing with really are dealing with state law, so I don't see the impact. So, is there anything that you think we should be thinking about with regards to this in consideration of those bills? 
you might want to hear from other witnesses. I, I think it's very early in the process. Of so, this? Yes. Okay. You, you, at this point, clearly, you know what the point of view or objective of the executive order is. That's pretty clear. What's actually going to come out of it? What changed to their guidance, much less what changed to their regulations, much less what impact that may have, much less attempts to change the federal statute, all of that is unknown. So it's, how do you, how do we predict the future? I think you have to see what happens. Now there may be other witnesses who are more knowledgeable about this area disagree, who, and you should hear from them. But I don't see this very preliminary executive order having any impact over the next year or two. I think you have to let the process play out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have uh, Maria um, and Luke coming back to join us at 3.30 um, to go through S95, um, which we've already had a walkthrough on, um, and uh, some amendments that